President Ross, Chancellor Thorpe, distinguished alumni, members of the Platform Party, colleagues. Jackie colleagues means faculty, staff, and students. Yeah. Colleagues. <laughs> I'm here to talk about water. And it may seem that water is an odd focus for a water, uh, University Day speech. It's not really the stuff that provokes wild academic excitement. And as long as it flows from the shower head, pours from the faucet, flushes the toilet, maybe waters the yard, we barely register its presence. Contrast the fact that the inquiring minds of humankind have only ever yet found liquid water on a thin film on the surface of one planet, our planet. And it's on that film that we depend, absolutely. Civilizations have evolved around it and have crashed when they exceeded its bounds. Communities have prospered because of it and founders on its sorry, founded on its exhaustion. Populations have grown because of the sustenance that it enabled and died because of the diseases with which it's associated. Moving water transcends cultures. It provides the sights and sounds that we all associate with rest and relaxation. And as water may seem an odd theme, I may seem an odd speaker for today. I'm not a Tar Heel born, nor am I a Tar Heel bred, nor am I a UNC alum. But I can claim that moving here two years ago, years ago closed a loop that was left open more than half a century ago. Herman Beatty was a 1917 graduate of this university, and he went on to receive the first PhD in sanitary engineering ever awarded by a US university. He returned here and became the dean of engineering, leaving this university only to become the first head of environmental health at the World Health Organization. That was the role that I inherited 50 years later, and which I then left to come back here. Now, my due diligence in Geneva involved asking anyone I knew with a US accent or a US education what they knew about UNC. Now, I confess, I have since arriving here learned that that's not an optimal research method, <laughs> and I should have sought IRB approval before embarking on this work. <laughs> but my respondents were remarkably clear. They were absolutely consistent. They referred to the fact, every single one of them referred to the fact, that at Carolina, people work, support one another and work together. And when they told me that, it wasn't something glib, reassuring, and cozy. It was something that defined what this university is about. What I'd like to do today is make to you the case that that importance of water, combined with a defining characteristic of our university community, offer an exceptional opportunity for world-leading, no, more, world-changing academic endeavor. And I'll call on two advocates to help me in that. Since taking office, my first advocate, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, has marked World Water Day every year. And she summarized in 2010, saying, water represents one of the great diplomatic and development opportunities of our time. It's not every day that you find an issue where effective diplomacy and development will allow you to save millions of lives, feed the hungry, empower women, advance national security, and protect the environment, and demonstrate to billions of people that the United States cares. Water is that issue. She referred to saving millions of lives, and the evidence supports her. Lack of water and sanitation kills more people than HIV, malaria, and accidents all combined. And in North Carolina and across the US, investment in simple water systems brought typhoid, then a major killer, under control in the first half of the 20th century. Today, UNC researchers provide evidence to support the formulation of new international development tar targets. They lead work, for example, in China, where they remedy toxic algae in a lake that supplies water to 12 million people. And they collaborate with private sector partners, like P&G, on evaluating and propagating simple life-saving interventions. Yet key, complex research questions remain. 
How do we prevent the waterborne disease outbreaks that affected more than half a million Americans in the 1990? And how do we deliver sustainable services to billions of people who lack them worldwide? Secretary of State Clinton also referred to feeding the hungry. Just this month, we've seen on the news painful images of starving children in Somalia, and we've seen footage of barren fields in the world's breadbasket, the American heartlands. Drought is a matter of life and death for subsistence farmers. And in the US, it means not only that food prices here will jump by perhaps 5%, but it also limits the availability of commodities like corn and soybean internationally. Again, our researchers are engaged, looking at innovative ways to, re to redistribute risk, financial insurance-based mechanisms to reduce the impact of drought, and leading the development of cyber infrastructure to enhance access to data that's vital for effectively managing water resources. But again, the need for evidence to inform us on how to do better challenges research. How to cope with ever scarcer water matters here, it matters nationally, and it matters internationally. And yet, adaptation to a changing climate is insufficient, and our understanding of how to, how to adapt to a changing climate is inadequate. What about empowering women? Today, the average woman in rural Africa will spend a quarter of her time collecting and carrying water. Globally, girls lag boys in achieving educational targets, and the lack of water is a cause. Girls miss school when, like their mothers, they shoulder the burden of collecting water. And they are absent and drop out early for the lack of privacy and security, something as simple as a toilet in which to practice menstrual hygiene. Again, our, user, our researchers are involved, exploring the practical implications of the recent recognition of a human right to water and sanitation, what it means, what it comprises, how to measure compliance with it, and how to support its implementation. And again, basic questions remain, remain unanswered. Evidence suggests that water planning and management are more effective and more efficient when women are involved. We shouldn't be surprised. But it also confirms that often they are not. And how to enable and secure that participation still remains unclear. Secretary of State Clinton also referred to national security. She reiterated that at the UN General Assembly just two weeks ago, saying that water is fundamental now to peace and to security. A National Intelligence Council report that was prepared during her leadership reached worrying conclusions. That water-related problems would lead to the instability of countries, and that instability, combined with other factors, may lead to country failures that water may be increasingly used in terrorism and inter or intra-country leverage and conflict. That depletion of groundwater for irrigation in areas like the Middle East and the Western US would stress national and global food markets. And that water shortages and pollution would adversely affect the economic performance of countries through energy generation, manufacturing, resource extraction. I confess when I read this, it was kind of a bit like I'd expected from a national security report. What shocked me was the next part. That report went on to conclude that improving water management provided opportunities to cope with all of those concerns. I can barely imagine a more wide-ranging, exciting, and influential research agenda. Understanding of every single one of those challenges and opportunities is insufficient. And finally, protecting the environment is perhaps so linked to water that it needs no explanation. It's fundamental to the ecosystems of which we are part and on which we depend. Those ecosystems have value in biodiversity and conservation, through natural beauty and enhancement of our quality of life, by supporting industries like tourism and fishery, and through the natural treatment services that they provide us for the wastes that we pour into them. Here and abroad, those ecosystems 
and the services that they provide us are threatened. We use, for example, Lake Victoria, the third biggest lake in the world, which has been systematically diminished by population growth, invasive species, agricultural runoff, and industrial effluents, undermining subsistence fishery, degrading beauty, leading to the extinction of half the Kitchlid fish species that once shared this planet with us. Here in North Carolina, climate change may fundamentally affect the future of our outer banks. And responding to the energy demands that we experience brings the potential impacts of fracking to fresh waters and of offshore drilling to coastal waters. Again, UNC researchers are engaged, determining the value of ecosystem services to humankind, investigating the effects of the Deepwater Horizon oil, oil rig spill, and developing state-of-the-art models to predict storm surges from hurricanes and tropical storms. And yet we still know so little about some truly urgent and complex issues. For example, the connections between the demands we make on water, energy, and food, densely interdependent, and the way in which those demands are driven by both a growing and an ever more demanding population, whether locally, nationally, or internationally. Clearly, Secretary of State, the US Secretary of State, sees water as a critical opportunity. Holden, you set the bar for us when you described our to-do list as nothing less than the greatest challenges of our time. You set the bar, we jumped. Just a few months ago, we committed to mobilize around a common theme that was facing our society. And we adopted water not only as this university's first ever campus-wide theme, but the first two-year theme of any US university. Here, we're already developing new courses with collaborations across disciplines and among schools, expanding interdisciplinary research initiatives. We're celebrating the vibrancy, the power, and the beauty of water through new creative works in the visual perform and performing arts with student, faculty, and visiting artists from all over, our, all over our world. And we're recognizing and securing the added value of combining the perspectives from different disciplines within humanities and sciences, combining those to give greater insight on how to challenge, how to confront today's complex water challenges. I think my second advocate, Charles Fishman, captured the vision of this theme better than any of us in his book, The Big Thirst. He said, the goal is not just to bring water issues to the prominence for students, no matter their area of study. The frank ambition of the two-year effort will be to make Carolina a global center of water expertise and innovation. To do for water what, for example, Stanford does for Silicon Valley. Remarkably, there isn't any place like that in the US today. Earlier today, we all gathered by the old well and as far as I can tell, UNC is the only university in the world to have a piece of water infrastructure as its official symbol. <laughs> Today, it serves mainly as a stunning photographic backdrop and a place where our students, by tradition, take a drink for good luck. But for many years, we should not forget that it served as the source of water for the inhabitants of our student residences, for everything from drinking through to washing. In 1923, long after the well was converted to the form that we saw today, a survey of tenant farmers in North Carolina showed that none had running water and eight of 175 had outside privies. In case anyone's in, in any doubt, the ones that didn't have outside privies didn't have inside privies either. Yeah? That's roughly the situation of rural Somalia today. In less than 100 years, this state has transformed itself. This university contributed to that transformation, and managing water contributed to that transformation. Today, a new cycle of water challenges confront North Carolina, the US, and the world. These are challenges that will demand interdisciplinary international initiatives 
initiatives that will deliver financial innovation in managing water supplies, technological innovation in augmenting water resources, scientific innovation in understanding the health and ecosystem impacts of new contaminants, social innovation in bringing water and sanitation to the unserved, policy innovation to address threats such as climate change, and artistic innovation to raise awareness of global water challenges and convey the universality of water. These are challenges that require vision and cooperation to solve. They're challenges that require evidence to inform policy and to improve practice. They're challenges that call for academic leadership. Colleagues, I believe that we have a rare, possibly unique opportunity. In a university that can both celebrate water and study water, that benefits from faculty, staff, and student bodies that pull together. And thanks to the giants on whose shoulders we stand and one of whom we lost earlier today. We have the opportunity to become a leader, the academic leader, for a defining challenge of the 21st century. And if we choose to take that opportunity, we have the capacity to leave this state, this nation, and our world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, for a perfect talk. We're so proud that you're here, so proud of what we're doing uh, with the two-year theme and with water, and I can't imagine a better way to demonstrate the breathtaking scope and excellence of the research and teaching of this great university. So thank you for being with us today.